this message. She said, oh, it'll be all right. You'll do fine. I said, maybe. She went on, took her shower. I turned on my, my phone. Bible verse was on there today. This is what said. I cheated a little bit because some of this come this morning. I didn't have time to do a whole bunch of writing. This is what the message said. It said, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. Think about Him in all your ways. And He will guide you down the right path. So I took that as God said, trust in the Lord. When I was sitting there in the chair, and the Holy Spirit was Go read 2 Timothy chapter 2, what you did not preach last week. So I did. And I want to read a few verses from that. So if you want to turn with me to 2 Timothy in chapter 2, it'll help you to better understand where I'm coming from. If I can find it, home. I've got it. Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 2. Are you guys there? Yeah. Amen. Okay, I'm all tied to the Dorothy. I'm going to try to lighten it up a little bit here. I'm all the time trying to, trying to mess with Dorothy's head, I guess you could say. And say, Dorothy, what did I preach on last week? And most of the time she'll say, Well, I don't know. <laughs> Dorothy, I'm never going to do that again. We got the Bible study Friday night or Wednesday night. We was going through our Bible study and Ralph said, Ricky, what was the last verse you preached Sunday morning? <laughs> I said it was verse 15. Study to show thyself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. See, God's in the lead. I'm the workman. I'm the one that's that's bringing forth the message. And He led me on to a few other verses. Because people are scared 
that might upset somebody or it might offend somebody and then they'll leave and then you won't have them there and then you won't have no time. See, in this day and age in which we live, we've got a lot of things in pastors and teachers and preachers which the Bible calls them ear ticklers. They tell you what you want, they want you to hear that will make you feel good, that will make you want to come back and pump some more money into their money. But in all reality, there are things in here that if a lot of churches today would still preach, the world wouldn't be in as bad a shape as it's in. See, that's where, that's where we went wrong. We were talking about generational things in Bible study. And from one generation to the next generation, God's Word is supposed to be handed down. And then that next generation hands it down to the next generation. See, God's been faithful to get His Word from then to there to now, but nobody will preach it. Nobody will teach it. And I mean, I was all tore up over this until I started learning not to doubt God. Why do, we, why do I doubt God? He's never once failed me. He's always come and given me the words to say. He's always met me here. Why would I doubt now? But why am I preaching this message? Because just like my wife said this morning, it needs to be said, somebody somewhere, wherever your voice is going, somebody needs to hear this. And you know, I got to thinking about that. There's a lot of truth in that. Because God sees the whole picture. Now I'm thinking, Lord, these are my brothers and sisters. They're not doing that kind of stuff. See, I don't know that. There could be somebody out there or wherever that's doing that. And I thought, Lord, this is supposed to be a message about love and caring for people and Jesus and pat them on the back and edifying them and making them feel good. And the Holy Spirit immediately said, this is a message. I mean, so fast. Let me read that last verse again to you in 2 Timothy that I just read. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at will. Okay, remember that. This will help you maybe understand a little bit of what's happening today in this message. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. There, say amen. amen. It says this. It says, If then you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. See, we get caught up in the things of this world and the things that are on earth when we are actually supposed to start being thinking of things above. I'm guilty. And I'm learning the more and more that I start to put those things out of my life the more and more I see God show up in my life and take care of the things when I should be going and doing this for the Lord, but i got to do this for myself. But if you'll learn, if you'll go do this for the Lord, He'll make sure that that's taken care of. I guarantee you that. You see, you all know I'm a big gardener. I love it. I love the garden. But it's constant battle with weeds. Amen, Janie Gray. So when God called me to preach and I thought, how in the world am I going to do all this stuff? 
take nothing away from me, and He blessed me. He blessed me, Dorothy. Say, He'll bless me. Amen. See, He gave me this material that's called weed barrier that's made out of nylon, and a horse can't pull it in two. It'll let the water go through to the ground, and guess what? There ain't no weeds coming through it. So, Rick, I require more of your time, Ricky, but instead of you worrying about your garden, I'm going to bless you with this stuff, and then you won't have to worry about me. And then you can take that time and give that time to me to study and to do what I've called you to do. Amen? Quit sitting there smirking. I told you, didn't I? God will always make you a way. He will not call you to do something on your own, and He's not out there waiting to beat you up because you didn't do something right. He wants you to follow Him. He wants you to trust Him, and He will take care of what needs taken care of in your life. If you trust Him. Amen? Amen! Amen. See, He'll show you that He's always a step ahead of you. And you. And me. Amen. You asleep, Danny? Good. All right. See, God, God is a God that's not sitting in heaven waiting on you to sin so He can pop you into hell. No. He's not that kind of God. But He is a God that hates sin. He hates it. He hates it so much that He sent His Son to die to wipe out the sins of the world to save you and me and anyone who would call on His name. Amen? Amen. And it says, little buddy, my mouth's like eating cock. Would you forgive me a bottle of water? See, he says, set your affections on things not of this earth, but things that are above. For you are dead in Christ, and your life is hid with Christ. Your real life is hid with Christ in God. It's not about this life. I've preached this over and over, and apparently God wants us to get it. It's not about this life, church. It's about where we're going to. We're just passing through. But while we're passing through, we can enjoy things a little bit. But you've got to put God in the perspective place that He's supposed to be in. He's supposed to be the number one thing in your life. And I've actually heard pastors say they pray about what they should wear. They put God first in everything that they do. Do you put God first in everything that you do? Now, I'm a pastor. i got to tell you the truth. No, not sometimes I don't. Why? Because sometimes it's human nature and this flesh, oh, I can do that. But what would it have been after I tore that up and messed that up, what would it have been if I would have talked to God? What would it have been if I would have just talked to God about it? How would it have turned out? See, God wants you to put Him number one. He wants you to pray about everything. He tells us in His Word, pray without ceasing. Pray about everything with prayer and supplications. Pray about everything in your life. Put Him number one. Put Him number one. And you're going to think, when I get on down here a little further, well, how does all this go together? And hopefully I can show you at the end. He goes on in, chapter, in verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then He also shall appear with Him in glory. What are we doing if we're not doing that? When we're out here doing our own thing, our own way, and Christ appears, where would we be? What would we be? See, we're dead with Christ. Christ is the number one thing in our lives. 
He wants to be the number one. And if you're putting him number one, and this one is seeing their life work out so perfectly, and all these other people are seeing that, and they're watching you, and they do watch you like a hawk if you play Christian. But when they see you putting God number one, and they see your life working out, and all these blessings in your life, what does that do to them? I want some of that. See, it goes on. One teaching one, and then that one teaching another one. And so on and so on. God wants to be what in your life? Number one. But how are you going to put all this stuff together, Rick? I'll show you. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then He shall appear with Him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are up on the earth. Now, mortify means to kill them, to do away with them, to get done with them, of things of this flesh and your members, what you are doing. And such things as fornication. Fornication is one of the biggest sins in the world today. And I have been a nervous wreck about preaching about this. But this is what God wants me to say and what God wants me to preach, so I have to do that. Fornication is an illicit sexual act outside of marriage before God. And the Bible goes as far to say, if you fornicate like that, you not only sin against God, but you sin against your own body. You know, how many babies have been brought in this world through fornication that have just been tossed to the side? Nobody cared about them. They end up through an adoption agency. They end up in foster homes. And a lot of times they're raped and they're abused and they're not taken well care of just so the foster people can get the money from the government. Just that one sin alone. Look how much it's torn out of society. Am I preaching the truth? Amen. Uncleanness. Inordinate affections. Does anybody know what that means? I do if I'm fine. It's something that's in excessive or that goes way beyond the normal limits. It's an overly obsessive love. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, chocolate. I'm serious. That's what it used. Or you fantasy football junkies. Do you spend more time hunting chocolate and looking up your fantasy football team than you do with God? <coughs> do you play on your phone more than you do and read your Bible? Now I know we got phones and I know we read Bible on a phone. And I do that myself. But it's not like picking this book up and reading it from this book. It's not. It's not the same. Trust me, it's not the same. Let's see, I think that's all. To overindulge in excess. That's what that inordinate affection is. And then he goes on and he says, evil, I have a hard time with this word, concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. See, you just take those sins right there alone. What they've done to families, what they've done to society, There's, there's people in my life that I know, as my mom would say, were born in these situations. They were just yanked up by the hair of the head when nobody really cared about them. See, these sins are not to be taken lightly. But just, just 
Stay with me. chapter 6. Are you there? Oh, I'm not. I'm going to start out in verse 8. It says, Nay, ye do wrong, and ye defraud, and that your brethren Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. So many people, they wink at their sin. They don't take their sin seriously. They don't have no fear of God. What kind of a merciful God could send anyone to hell? That's their mind frame. And they, they take their sin so lightly. But it's not a light thing to do in God's eyes. And he goes on to say, They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. That, my friends, is pretty scary. When's the last time you heard a message like this in church? As Brother Danny says, I ain't getting many likes on this one. I've heard him say it more than once because it's up that he was preaching. But he was preaching the truth. And he told me one day this day is going to come for you. And I've been a wreck over it. But there's somebody, if they're out there in YouTube world or wherever this thing goes to, or inside this church, whoever needs to hear it, somebody needed to hear it. And I pray, my prayer is that they'll hear it. And they'll let it hit their heart. And that snare that the devil's got around him, they'll be able to be loosed from that snare. By hearing the truth. Amen? Now at the end of this, praise God. Praise God. Then in your old school, what they used to preach? They preached stuff like this back in the day, didn't they? And the church slowly, see Danny's old school like me, when I went to church, when I was a kid, you heard messages like this all the time. 
You see, we've changed to fit the culture. We haven't changed to fit the Word of God. You see, we have to change to fit God's Word, not the culture. Satan is a deceiver. He is slick and sly as any fox that ever lived on this earth. He knows how to deceive. Let's just entertain all of God's people with a cell phone. That way they don't really know what's going on and all the smoke behind the screens. They won't know about this because they're walking around like this and they've got no clue what's going on in the world. None. See, that's what Satan does. He entertains you. He gives you something that your flesh loves. He wants to give you things so that you can't see the real truth of what He's trying to accomplish. And most of the time, it's tearing families apart, it's ruining kids' lives, and they don't know nothing. All they know is push a button. I get on my own son all the time. Teach him something besides that phone. Don't just give him that phone to occupy him so you don't have to get up and do something what a parent should do. Am I telling the truth? How many times do you see it? Just to get them to be quiet. I got quiet like this. I told you once that's enough. It was over. Now she's little, but she was bad back in the day. To wear you out. See, this sounds like a harsh message. But this is God's truth. Okay. Hold your spot there. Now go back to Colossians. Chapter 3. Hold your spot there in 1 Corinthians. We'll start out in verse 7. In which you have walked some time when you lived in them. But now you also put off all these. Not only get rid of all that other sin, now you've got to get rid of this stuff. Number one on the list is anger. Who gets angry in our house? Who gets angry in our house? I do. She is the worst, but I'm there. She is the worst, but I'm there. She is the worst. Ah, oh, baby, I love you. What are you cooking for dinner? Bored? <laughs> you got 
accept the truth and they don't want to hear the truth. It's my Bible says sometimes people would rather climb a tree and tell a lie than stand on the ground and tell the truth. Anybody ever heard that? But what's the Bible say about telling a lie? It says that all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. That's what it says. And then he goes on to say, Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and you have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. See, we're supposed to turn in to the image of the one that created us. Does that happen overnight? Not for me, it didn't. Some people get it, some people get it really fast, and some people can change really quick. But for the most of us, it's a process. Papa asked me, he said, I got saved. I know I did. I'm saved. I know I am. Why am I still doing the same thing I did when I'm not saved? Flesh. This stuff right here. As Ralph says, it's the worst enemy. And until you're in that brand new body, you're going to miss it and you're going to fail. But if you're living a lifestyle of fornication and unrighteousness and being in malice and all this other things that the Bible talks about and thieves, the Bible says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But that's only for the pro bad people. No, it ain't. It's for anybody that does it. Amen? Then the Bible goes on. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. See, we've done a lot of messages since I've been preaching about becoming the image of Christ. About becoming Christ-like. See, that's our goal in the Christian life is to become like Jesus. We're supposed to become like Jesus. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all. Hear that? Christ is all and in all. Christ is in everything we do if we're saved, supposed to. He's in all these different types of Whether they're gone, whether they're free. If they accept Jesus as their Savior, it doesn't matter. We're all the same Christians. And he goes on in verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God. See, God has elected you because you have been saved, sealed, and sanctified. So you are God's elect. And I am God's elect. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows full of mercy. Now are we going to put on mercy when something happens or somebody does us wrong? Or are we going to put on anger? The Bible says to tell, tells us to put on vows of mercy. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Boy, we don't like that one. We don't like that one, do we? Uh uh. I don't want to suffer. Uh uh. Jesus did. So if we're going to be like Jesus, we're going to suffer. That's 
some point, some way, somewhere, we're going to suffer. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, also you forgive him. Now this is what this is what tears me up. And I have heard so many Christians say that. I am very quick to forgive. I can forgive you and forget it. Here we go. I forgive her, but I ain't gonna forget it. Nope. I won't forget that. But I'll forgive her. Well, let me ask you a question. If you forgive her, and you still remember it, where's it really at still? It's in your heart. So if you can't forget it, and it, sometimes it takes time. I know that. God knows that. But to forgive truly in a process of time, we forget. See, God's better than we are. God said, I will forgive you and I will never remember it again. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So if He can never remember it again, why can you not forget it? Flesh. We don't want to. They hurt us. They hurt us. Amen? They hurt us. Yeah, they did. But what did they do to Jesus? What did they do to Jesus? They hurt him. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfection. Charity is love. How many know what that bond of perfection is? This is what it says. It is such a love which God requires in the hearts of all. And it is such selfless, selfless, not selfish, selfless love, which moves people, you ready for this? To obey God. Can you believe that? See, what you and I do and what you and I form ourselves into says a whole lot about who we're going to attract. But you can't say, oh, how good Jesus is and how good this is and how good that is and so on and so on and then go out here and commit fornication and let somebody see it because trust me, church, they are watching us like a hawk. We are judged the harshest of any people on earth. You've got to become Christ-like. Because the world is watching me and you. And if we're really truly being like Christ with that selfless love and showing it to the world
time I went the wrong way with it. Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, or nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And listen to me, church, and some was such as you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. And I know Jesus Christ, when he hung on that cross and he had a thief beside him, the thief didn't even ask him. Be forgiven. All he said was, remember me, and Jesus said this day, you will be with me in paradise. He didn't even say, have to forgive me, Lord, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. See, Jesus knew a thief, and Jesus was full of love, and when he asked Jesus to remember him, the Lord Jesus Christ forgave him in a moment like that, and he said, you will be with me today in paradise. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. That's how fast that God can deliver you. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Think about that. I was about six or seven of those. Why did he call me to preach? See, this is one of the things I have such a tough time with. I've done all these bad things. How could God want me? Because he loves you. He loves me. He's not waiting on you to sin and pass you to hell. He's waiting on you to come out of that sin so He can give you eternal life. Hallelujah. Praise Him, church. Praise Him. Praise Him. He wants you to come out of that sin. And He knows that the way we act and the way we choose to live our life, that's what's going to draw people away from sin, not push them into it. Amen. 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 I've got to tell you, I was scared to death when God did this to me. But I understand. God can take the captive and free them from the snare of the devil. That fast. And I'm not telling you to take these sins lightly. Any sin. Because the thing of it is, you and I don't know when we're leaving this earth. And I don't know about you all, but I want to try to take as many with me as I can. But how we live our lives, what does it say about Jesus? Does it say Jesus lives in us? Does it say Jesus lives in us part of the time? Does it say Jesus lives in us when we're in a real needy situation? Or does it just plain say, I love Jesus, I follow Jesus, and I live with Jesus every day? Amen, sister. It might.